hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Ho, and this is my 14th year uh, on the faculty here. Um, I have, thank you. Um, I'm older than I look, maybe, I don't know. Um, I, I have loved every year that I've been here, and I'm really looking forward to this one with all of you. So uh, I am a psychometrician, and my standard line when I say that I'm a psycho psychometrician is that I know it sounds more like an insult than a job title. <laughs> so, oh, excuse me. Uh, let's see if I can go back. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, but a psychometrician, for those of you who don't know, studies educational and psychological testing. And my work tries to make educational tests more useful to students and parents and teachers and school leaders and policymakers. Now, sometimes making tests more useful means using tests less. Sometimes making tests more useful means using tests less. And that tension is what I want to talk about today in the short talk that I am calling Strength in Numbers. So over the past decade, my colleagues, Sean Reardon, Ben Shear, Aaron Faley, and I have been working on a project we call the Educational Opportunity Project. We often liken our work to building a telescope in this case, a metaphorical telescope that allows us to better view educational opportunity. By analogy, here is a picture that many of us saw this summer that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And here I'm going to show a picture of the same area of space that was taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, a newer and improved telescope. This is what it looks like. See that? Is that, is that a little bit clearer, right? So, so, uh, so we, when it comes to educational opportunity, we hope we can see with similarly clear eyes. These are data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, a test that enables us to compare educational opportunity across states. The darker blue states here have higher scores and greater educational opportunities, and the lighter blue states have lower scores and less. Now think of this as an image from Hubble. In our project, we try to improve our resolution like James Webb. Using statistical and psychometric methods, we can zoom in from states to districts and even schools, and it looks like this. So here, the dark green districts have academic opportunities that are six grade levels higher than the dark blue and purple districts. Now this visual comes from our analysis of 500 million test scores over six grades and 11 years. We hope that it helps to improve our understanding of educational opportunity in the United States. You may see some of these data in your classes this year. You can download it, it all yourself. You can explore, for example, the relationship between educational opportunity and parental wealth, where districts with greater socioeconomic opportunities have, on average, greater educational opportunities. You'll see in this slide grade levels on the vertical axis and socioeconomic status on the horizontal axis. Now, higher levels of one, as you can see, predict higher levels of the other. But though the correlation here is strong, it is not perfect. Looking closer, for example, at the five largest school districts in the country, you can see that districts with similar socioeconomic status can still differ di substantially in opportunity by one to two grades. Demography is not destiny, at least not necessarily. You can also explore relationships in different states, where here, for example, we see states in the state of Massachusetts in blue and districts in California in red. You can see Boston as that big blue dot and Los Angeles as that big red dot. Now, Massachusetts has substantially greater educational opportunities than California on average by one to two grade levels, even when socioeconomic status levels are the same. And of course, we want to look at progress over time. After all, our interest is not simply in where there are educational opportunities, but where those opportunities are improving. Looking from year to year, you can see districts change. Here's 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, and 16. I can show that again, right, with districts that are going to make substantial progress and other districts that are going to decline. Here's 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, right? So I hope these data show strength in numbers. 
in one sense of the phrase, that numbers make our evidence base stronger, and in this way, we have greater strength in numbers. We can use quantitative data to reveal truths and identify solutions. Now, our data have been used in 100 or more published research studies and counting, including many by our own students here at Harvard. As states make test score data available from this past spring in 2022, we hope to additionally learn more about the effects of the pandemic on academic learning and speed resources to those who need them most. But there is another way in which I believe it is important to have strength in numbers. Our database harnesses the power of, I said, 500 million test scores, 500 million. That is 500 million times a child sat down for hours to learn about their strengths and their areas for growth. Numbers can be a powerful way to learn about areas of strength and areas for improvement. But unfortunately, those numbers are not always used to identify a child's strengths. Too often, a child interprets a low score as a permanent deficit. I am bad at math. I am not a good reader. Sometimes, a parent or teacher may misinterpret a test score as indicating that a child cannot learn. This is not strength in numbers. This reveals how we are, in fact, weak to numbers. We imbue them with a strength they do not deserve. We traffic in what I call the three fallacies of test score interpretation, that these numbers are more meaningful, more precise, and more permanent than they actually are. More meaningful, more precise, and more permanent than they actually are. Sometimes it takes work to see strength in numbers, to take a low score, and to see that number not as a deficit or are as our failure, but as a compass, a compass that points the way to what we can learn next. And sometimes having strength in numbers means disregarding numbers. We have to reject and resist when someone misinterprets numbers to claim that we cannot learn or that our school is failing. When others misinterpret numbers as our deficits, we must refute them. We have to lift ourselves and each other up with numbers or against numbers to remind ourselves of our strengths, our assets, and our funds of knowledge. So my hope for you this year is strength in numbers. May you learn to use numbers to build evidence and to make meaning. May you learn to resist and refute others when they use numbers to exclude or demean you and your communities. And may you learn how to quantify facets of humanity without reducing our humanity. May you see your strength in numbers. Thank you.